Hello. This is not the first time that I've given an annual talk for Freelance Fridays. In fact, let me check. It's the 14th time. However, it is the first time that I've not given it live in person and also the first time that I haven't given it on a Friday but on a Wednesday instead. Now, as anyone who's come to a number of my talks uh, will know, there are several themes that reoccur, one of them being time. Uh, the past, the present, the future, and the observation that uh, those who cannot remember the past are doomed uh, to repeat it. And its corollary, those who can remember the past are doomed to watch other people repeat it. You'll also know that I've made a number of predictions in the past that have turned out to be right. For instance, in 2009, that one day our houses would be lit only with lead lights, which we're pretty much close to now. Or that Linux would become a widely used operating system. In case you don't know, Android is based on Linux. Or in 2010, about the coming of the 10 euro computer. Uh, one of which I've got here, running one of my servers. Or how I've often laughed at about people who claim that Moore's Law uh, was close to its end, or even uh, that it's actually ended. Now, you may wonder how I've been able to make such correct predictions, and so I've decided to come clean for the first time and tell you the truth. This hoodie already uh, gives a clue, but the fact is, I've got a time machine. Now, I know what you're thinking. That doesn't look like a time machine. Isn't it meant to look like a police phone box or something? Well, duh. Why does the one that you know so much about look like a, uh, uh, like a police box? Because it landed in London in 1963 and so disguised itself as a police box so that people wouldn't spot it. Unfortunately, in 1963, its chameleon circuit broke. Uh, and so it's stuck forever in police box mode. And, as you can probably imagine, it's next to impossible to get spare parts for a Type 4, 40 TARDIS anymore. Luckily, mine is both a slightly newer model, and furthermore, it's not broken. So, you didn't guess that it was a time machine, did you? It means it's working. Anyway, I thought, let's take the opportunity for me to take you on a trip in my time machine. So, let me first find my keys. Ah. Nice, eh? I thought I'd make it a bit more homely than your traditional uh, time machine, which tends to be a bit, well, flashy. Bunch of show-offs, really. All those flashing lights, all for show. Well, anyway. Where better place to go than visit my earlier self at the start of my career? I hope you've got your glass of sparkling wine, which is the traditional accompaniment to these talks, because you're going to need it as a muscle relaxant. relaxant. Time travel can take it out of you, and as they say, it's unpleasantly like being drunk. And if you don't know why that's unpleasant, ask a glass of water. joking. It doesn't make that sound really. It makes more of a sound like this. <laughs> Where did you suddenly appear from? You came in very quietly. Sorry, you seemed so busy. I didn't want to disturb you. Uh, what year is it? Uh, 1979. It worked. Good old Brighton. Hasn't changed a bit. Oh, wait though, it wouldn't have. 
Did you really forget what year it was? That's rich coming from somebody who once forgot how old he was. True. Wait a minute. How did you know that? Do, do I know you? You do look vaguely, vaguely familiar. Well, it's more like... I know you, but you don't know me. What, like you knew me when I was younger? Yeah, exactly. I knew you when you were younger. Okay, I see. Nice sweater, by the way. Doctor Who. Yeah, thanks. You watched the first episode, didn't you? Yes, I did. The day after JFK got assassinated. You do know a lot about me. Interesting style. What, uh, what's the hood for? It's fashion from the future. You can pull up the head, hood so that you can hide your face from all the cameras on the street. Very amusing. You should be on television. Have you ever thought about what you would do if you met yourself from the future? How your future self could prove that he was really you? Mm, no, not really. You should. So, what are you writing about so concentratedly? Um, my department has decided it wants to do more research and the head of the, my department is looking for, uh, for suggestions. And what ideas are you going to suggest? Um, do you know anything about computers? Somewhat. Well, um, we recently got a new mainframe computer and it is so hard getting my data from one co computer to the other. Uh, I think computer networks will really be important in the future. So uh, that is one suggestion. And these new digital watches with LCD screens, they use such little power that it would be amazing if we could make computer screens using them. Did you talk to anyone about this? Yeah, there's an uh, engineer in my department, but he said it, it wouldn't be possible because uh, it would need too many connectors. Shame. Any other ideas? Um, does the name Gordon Moore mean anything to you? It rings a bell. Okay, well, um, he's a top man at a new uh, integrated circuit company in America. Well, he made a prediction a few years back that integrated circuits would double in density at a constant price every year. Um, he recently revisited his pr uh, prediction and he now says the doubling will happen every 18 months for at least another 10 years. So um, they're calling it Moore's Law. Well, a doubling per 18 months, that's a tenfold improvement in, in five years, a hundredfold improvement in 10 years. Just imagine the power. Impressive. So what I'm thinking is we should plan for that and do research in things that would benefit from a hundredfold improvement in speeds and capacity. Like? Well, sound for instance. If you could record and store sound digitally, then copying it would be error-free. One of the biggest problems recording music is that each time you copy a recording, adding another track for instance, it adds noise. And did you talk to anyone about this idea? Yes, um, the head of the department is an ex-electrical engineer. So he did a quick calculation in his head saying that you would have to sample the sound at 30, 40 kilohertz, maybe 8 bits per sample, uh, twice that in stereo, so that's 5 megabytes per minute. In other words, you would only be able to fit one minute of music on a, one of our discs. So, what did he say? He didn't think it would catch on. And what did you say? Well, uh, I, I talked to him about Moore's Law, but he said that it would soon come to an end and, uh, because the physics of it means it's inevitable. Do you agree? I don't know. I, I went to a talk by a famous computer scientist, Grace Hopper. Oh yes, I remember. Oh, you were there as well? Uh, I heard about it. She had a 30 centimeter length of wire as a prop, didn't she? Yes, saying that is the distance light and electrons travel in a microsecond, so that very fact means that Moore's Law can't last long. Were you convinced? Hmm, not sure. Uh, she is a lot more experienced than me, but... Any other research ideas? Well, yes, photography. If you could digitize sound, well, then you could digitize light as well. Imagine the possibilities. Wouldn't that need even more storage? Well, a TV screen is 625 lines high, and the range of width to height is 4 to 3. So if we sample an image using 8 bits per vertical and horizontal point, it would only need 500 kilobytes. You could get 10, 10 images on a 5 megabyte disk. Interesting. Uh, you do seem to know quite a lot about this. What, what do you think? Hmm. Well, my advice is, you should live your life as if Moore's Law will never end. Okay, uh, and why is that? Well, do you know what improv people say? Improv? 
what's that? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, it's a style of comedy, it hasn't reached here yet. Anyway, they say, never say no. It's their fundamental conversational gambit. If you want to keep the flow going, be positive. Otherwise, the conversation comes to a sudden stop. So if you start off with the assumption that Moore's Law will end, you won't do the research. Then if it doesn't end, you will have missed your chance. On the other hand, if you assume it will keep going, and you're right, you'll be ahead. And everyone will call you visionary. And if you were wrong, well, at least you'll have tried. Good advice. Write it down. It's all right. I won't forget. Oh, trust me, you will. Write it down. So, ten years' time, computers are a hundred times faster. What more would you want? <laughs> a programming language that was easier to use? Ah, <laughs> too right. Write it down. Well, it's been nice talking to you. I'd best be off. Uh, one more thing. Look at this. <sighs> what was that? And who are you? Uh, I was looking for room 310. I, it was lightning, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, that's one floor up. Lightning on a day like this? Hey, where do you go? So today's talk is called The Future is Already Here, Just Not Very Evenly Distributed. It's a quote from the great futurist. Hey Google, who said the future is already here, just not very evenly distributed? William Gibson. On the website interactions.acm.org, they say, the title comes from a quote by American speculative fiction author William Gibson. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought you might say that. So, ACM Interactions. I think I've heard that name before. So the point is, the future doesn't suddenly happen, but comes creeping up like an oil slick. If you look at early cars, for instance, they really do look like horseless carriages and nothing like modern cars. They slowly changed bit by bit to become what they are now. Are. So it's interesting to try and identify which bits of current life are the future worming its way in. For instance, 30 years ago last month, the first web server went online. The web wasn't a sudden explosion. The internet already existed before the web and people like me were already transmitting and receiving files and communicating over the internet. Similarly, there were also already hypertext systems, just not connected to the internet. What the web did was just ju join the two together. And so it wasn't a shock at the time, it just made life somewhat easier. However, before it got fully accepted, we still had to go through several years of people moaning and WWW really stood for worldwide wait because it was so slow, or that it was just a passing fad, or that it was just for geeks. Anyway, I thought I would illustrate the theme of this evening's talk by taking an example of the object that we call the mobile phone. I say the object that we call the mobile phone because, frankly, most of the time, most people don't use it as a phone at all. It's just a handheld computer. Now, I try to live as much in the future as feasible and affordable since it helps deciding what research to do. <clears throat> For instance, I had an Internet-connected watch before there was even, even a mobile Internet. It was a clever device. It piggybacked on FM radio transmissions. You send it, sent messages over the internet and they would appear on your watch. You couldn't reply to them, but you could receive them. Similarly, before there were smartphones, I had a PDA that would use my non-smart mobile phone as a modem so that I could connect to the internet and read the web and stuff like that while 
moving around. Once the first smartphones had emerged, I joked in a talk at a conference that I had the world's smallest phone by showing what I used to have to carry, those two things on the left there, <clears throat> compared what I now carry to that thing on the right, which was clearly smaller than both of them. Unfortunately, the joke was meant to be that the phone had merged into the PDA, and so it had just become zero sized. But the joke fell flat. And at the end of the talk, lots of people came up to me to show that they had an even smaller phone than mine. Anyway, let's do a little bit more time travel and go back to 1998, the days of the introduction of the mobile phone, and this video of people being asked if they would ever use a mobile phone. Heeft u een mobiele telefoon? Nee, nee, nee. Waarom niet? Nou, dat heb ik niet nodig, want uh, ik word toch niet uh, gebeld of zo. Heeft u een uh, mobiele telefoon? Nee hoor, heb ik niet. Waarom heeft u er geen? Nou, ik zie er nu niet van in. U ziet er het nut niet van Absoluut in? Absoluut niet. Ja. Vindt u het belangrijk om altijd bereikbaar te zijn? Ook niet. <laughs> ik ben niet zo belangrijk. <laughs> dan ben je op de fiets en dan word je gebeld. <laughs> ik heb een gewone telefoon, waarvoor moet ik een mobiel hebben? Dat is handig. Ja, dat klopt, dat is handig. Maar als ik ergens strand, dan is er ook altijd ergens wel een telefoon zelf, een boerderij met een boer met een telefoon. Ik heb al een antwoordapparaat, dus thuis ben ik altijd al bereikbaar. Of dien dan terug te bellen als er is gebeld, maar ook nog eens uh, onderweg. Als ik in de trein zit of in de auto gebeld worden of zelf kunnen bellen, vind ik niet nodig. Dat vind ik zonde van mijn geld. Dat vind ik zonde van je geld? Ja, en het is meestal ook niet nodig. Ik zit meestal... Uh... Meestal heb ik wel een telefoon binnen handbereik. Dat vind ik niet nodig. Niet nodig? Nee. Maar maar. Het lijkt me helemaal niet leuk om elk... altijd bereikbaar te zijn. Ik ben student en uh, ik heb een antwoordapparaat en dat is prima. Ik zie het niet zo zitten, zo'n mobiele telefoon. We hebben het jaren zo gedaan en ik vind het wel goed zo. Ik heb een buswatje voor hoog, uh, hoog nodige problemen, denk ik. Maar ik hoef niet uh, continu zo'n piepding uh, op een terrasje te hebben en zo. Als mensen mij bereiken willen, dan kunnen ze dat met een brief doen en uh, is het dringend, dan ben ik telefonisch thuis te bereiken. Ja, ik, ik weet nu al dat ik hem overal laat liggen. Ik laat hem vallen. Ik ben ook gelukkig zonder. Amazingly enough, a Dutch TV program managed to tra track down three of those people, including the mother with the baby, who's now a grown man. And of course, they all had mobile phones. My pre-smartphone PDA had memory measured in megabytes rather than today's gigabytes. If I remember rightly, it had eight megabytes of memory. But there was this little Dutch company called Palmtop that was producing a remarkable maps program and series of maps. You bought a CD, and this was before DVDs had been introduced, uh, that contained a number of maps of world cities. And you could load one, or if they were small enough, and you were lucky, two onto your PDA and then use them for locating addresses and routes between addresses. So if you went somewhere, you loaded the map for that, for that city. Actually, it was instructive, instructive for me living in a circular city as I do, because the routes are not always intuitive. And uh, even for those who've lived there for, here for a long time, it's not the case. And this image shows that the shortest route from the beginning uh, of the Princeton graph to the end of it doesn't just follow the Prince of Craft, uh, but you go through the center of town. One day uh, I got an email from Palm Top where they expounded their view of the future where everyone would be able to have a device with the maps of the world on it and could search for the nearest shop or whatever and get a route to it and how they were going to rename themselves Tom Tom. Those early map systems and even smartphones, of course, didn't have GPS yet, uh, yet because frankly, it was just too demanding of the device, devices. GPS works by triangulation. You measure your distance or angle, it doesn't matter which, from something you do know the location of and then use that to calculate where you are. So for instance, if you know how far you are from a known point, then that X is the known point, then you know that you must be somewhere on that circle uh, from, that, from that point. Similarly, if you know your angle from the node point, then you know that you must be somewhere on that line. And so if you can combine them, uh, so for each thing you don't know, you need one extra independent me uh, measurement. So if you need to know your latitude and longitude, you have to have two independent pieces of information. For instance, the distance, the angle, and where they meet, you know that you're on the line, you know you're on the circle, so where they meet is the point where you are. Or 
if you had the angle from two different known points, then where those two lines meet is where you are. Normally, when mapping, you need to know three pieces of information, the latitude, longitude and height, because GPS, of course, works just as well when you're in an airplane as when you're on the ground. With GPS, you use your distance from the satellite spinning around the Earth. And it's actually extraordinary how many things you don't know when using satellites. First things first, the satellites are constantly sending signals down to the Earth. The signals identify which sent the satellite sent it, the time that the satellite sent that signal, you receive the signal, notice the time, record the sign, time, and then work out the time difference, and then work out, therefore, how long it took to reach you based on the speed of the light, what the distance is, is from where you are. Of course, the speed of light is very, very fast. So fast, in fact, that it's a sign of civilization when first people, when people first realize that light actually travels. The ancient Greeks did wonder if it traveled, but it wasn't until the 18th century uh, that we knew conclusively uh, and could measure it. It is in fact about a million times faster than sound. Now, of course, you know the speed of sound, right? During a thunderstorm, you count the seconds between the flash and the bang and divide by three to give you the distance in kilometers to the strike. You divide by three because sound travels at about 300 meters per second, which is about a third of a kilometer. So now you know light travels at about 300 million meters per second. In the case of our GPS satellites, which are 20,000 kilometers high, or if you want 20 million meters, that means it takes about a 15th of a second for the signals to reach us. So in other words, the timers have to be really, really good. But there's another problem. The satellites are all mutually synchronized, their clocks, but your phone's clock isn't synchronized. You know the time that the satellite said it was when it sent the signal, and you know the time that your phone said it was when you received the signal, but you don't know how your time relates to the satellite's time. So that means that you're actually four things that you need to know from GPS. The three parts of your position, height, width, uh, <laughs> height, latitude, and longitude, plus the difference in time be between your phone and the satellites. So that means, since you need that extra piece of information, you need to be able to see four satellites, not three. Okay, so now we know the distance between us and the satellites, but there's another thing we don't know, where the satellites actually are. Contrary to popular belief, they're not at fixed positions in the sky. For that to be possible, they'd have to be twice as high, more than 40,000 uh, kilometers high. No, the satellites are spinning around the Earth about twice a day traveling at 14,000 kilometers an hour, or if you want, four kilometers per second. In other words, really fast. So how do we work out where they are? Well, the satellites broadcast an almanac, which includes where they were at midnight, plus other information. It's not a big thing, this almanac, it's under two kilobytes, but the satellites broadcast it at a really slow speed, 50 bits per second. So it takes about 12 and a half minutes uh, for you to receive it. And that's why originally GPS systems used to start up so slowly. Nowadays, we can also get the almanacs over the internet. And so that since they're quite small, that's in no time. So that starts up, uh, speeds up the start time really, uh, really a lot. So from the almanac, we now know where they were at midnight, how fast they're traveling and in which direction. So now all we have to do is calculate how far they've traveled since midnight and work out where they are. There's more. It's actually even more complicated than that. If one sign of civilization is re realizing that light moves, it's an even greater sign of civilization realizing that time moves at different rates under different conditions. Because the satellites are moving at such a high speed, their time actually moves slower. But then so does ours, but at a different rate, because gravity slows time down as well. So to calculate where the satellites are, we have to actually take both theories of relativ relativity into account. And finally, there's one other thing we don't know, the speed of light. Although the speed of light in a vacuum is constant, we don't actually live in a vacuum, luckily, and so because the, the, atmos and the atmosphere slows light down. So to work out what the speed of light is today, and it does vary every day, they have a building somewhere at a no known location in the world, 
that uses exactly the same GPS calculations, but rather than working out where it is, works out what value for the speed of light would have given the right answer. They then beam that number up to the satellites so that it can be added to the almanac and beams down to you. So if we didn't take all these things into account, the accuracy of GPS would actually be no better than about 11 kilometers, which would, of course, be use useless. So as you can see, there's a lot of calculation to be done. And having done it once, your phone then has to do it over again, a second later, and then again, the next second. So it's no wonder that navigation apps use, actually use up so much battery. With early navigation programs on phones, uh, you had to have a separate dongle, or Bluetooth or infrared connected to your phone that did the reception of the signals and most of the calculations. But later those dongles got merged into the phone. So music dig digitization happened much earlier than you might have expected, uh, mainly thanks to the invention of the CD, which had a much greater capacity of data than, uh, than anything up to that point. First released in 1982, it had a capacity of 700 megabytes. Um, but despite it being a digital uh, uh, device, there was surprisingly little vision at the time for a digital future. For instance, they didn't include digital textual details of the content, like the song titles or uh, uh, the lyrics or whatever. It's strange that they, they just didn't do that immediately. The CD was the, is the last of the spinning carriers of music before music went completely solid state. Surprisingly, if you analyze the capacity of spinning music media from 1900 onwards, from wax cylinders through 78s, LPs, CDs, you can see that ca capacity grew exponentially uh, with a doubling time of about 10 years. So, so uh, not only memories, computer memories are uh, uh, growing exponentially, but, but music carriers grew exponentially as well, just not quite so fast. After music went solid state, there was a brief period uh, where digital port portable music players were, uh, were popular. And frankly, I never saw the attraction because mobile firm phones by then were just as capable and I didn't see any reason why you shouldn't just use your mobile phone. Digital photography became a reality uh, in 1995. The first consumer digital cameras emerged then, the Casio QV10, which cost me uh, 899 Dutch guilders, which I think if you take uh, inflation into account is probably about uh, 899 euros now. Uh, and it had a, 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 for now, in comparison with today, had a tiny image size of 320 by 240 pixels, which was actually a quarter of a typical uh, um, uh, personal computer screen at the time. So here's my very first digital photograph that I ever took. Uh, a, my first digital selfie taken in 1996 of 320 times 240 pixels. At that time, I was editor in chief of the magazine that we heard uh, mentioned earlier by uh, our friend Google, ACM Interac Interactions, which is a publication on human computer interaction, in fact, the world's most read publication on that subject. And in November 1999, uh, we published a special issue reporting on a really interesting project that was investigating what people would do if digital cameras were integrated into mobile phones. How would they use it? What effect would it have? I really loved uh, the picture of the little girl on the, uh, on the cover there and, uh, and her brother who's there looking at the screen of the, uh, of the uh, digital camera. So here you see uh, the kid, uh, a kid, uh, using the digital camera. Uh, it's connected by a cable to uh, the electronics in his backpack and that's uh, the huge electronics representing the mobile phone that would later be able to be uh, miniaturized into, into a phone. So early mobile phones used early LCD screens. At first they were small, slow, monochrome and text only. Then you got some very basic color. So the Siemens S10 in 1998 was the first color phone, it just had four colors, uh, blue, red, green, and white. Uh, and, uh, and it was only text, it wasn't a graphics uh, screen. 
And then uh, three years later, was it? Yes, uh, the Sony Ericsson T68 was the first color graphics phone. Uh, you can see uh, it's a slightly larger screen. It was faster, it was cheaper, and it was more colorful. By 2007, LCDs had become fast enough, large enough, affordable enough for them to uh, overtake traditional CRT television tubes. Uh, and here you can see uh, the orange line, which is LCD televisions, overtaking uh, the blue line, which is uh, uh, cathode ray tube televisions, as the sales of those plummeted uh, and they cross in 2007. Funny enough, we're now seeing almost exactly the same developments as we saw in LCD in, uh, in e-ink. E-ink is what's used for uh, e-book readers. And it's advantageous because it's much more energy efficient and so uses less battery, which is great for mobile devices. Uh, you see, do see a fair few phones with uh, e-ink displays, but it's mainly, mainly in e-book readers, uh, which typically only need to be recharged every week or so. Uh, but up to now, e-ink has been monochrome and slow. But this year, uh, the first color e-books will be released. Uh, here's an example of one with the backlighting on and off. As you can see, it's still fairly basic color. It's rather washed out, uh, but it's color. It's a, it's a new development, and it's also quite slow still. And if all, in fact, this week... And in fact, this week... Uh, there was a new e-ink screen announced. I have no idea how fast it is, but if this is a real picture of it, then you can see the quality is much better. The colors are much more vibrant and, uh, and uh, the resolution is very, very much better. So it'll be great to see devices using that. And there's one other thing uh, that a few e-ink displays, although only monochrome ones, are now fast enough to actually display video in a reasonable quality. So let me just show, give you an example of a, a, a large screen e-book reader displaying a video. This is not the first time that I've given an annual talk for Freelance Fridays. In fact, let me check. It's the 14th time. However, it is the first time that I've not given it live in person, and also the first time that I haven't given it on a Friday, but on a Wednesday instead. So, in conclusion, once, long ago, a very famous person whose name I shan't give so that I can't name and shame him or her, said to me, I'll never use an LCD screen. The quality is just not good enough. And as I said in another Freelance Friday talk a long time ago, never is a very long time.